Hey everyone, and welcome to this AP Environmental Science Lecture on the Unequal Heating of Earth. In this module on uh, global climates and biomes, we're going to look here at the factors affecting weather and climate. And we're what we're going to notice is that the distribution of heat and precipitation is going to determine an area, locations, climate, and weather. But what we're also going to see is how these factors contribute in regards to ocean and air currents as well. So when we talk about climates, we have to talk about this unequal heating of the Earth. And in order to do that, we're going to look at, in this lecture, the makeup of the, of the Earth's atmosphere. We're going to move on and look at sunlight and the angle of sunlight and how it spreads out energy when it hits the Earth. And then finally, we're going to look at the tilt of the Earth's axis and how that affects the energy received from one season to the next. So before we get moving here onto the layers of the atmosphere, let's just make sure we understand the difference between weather and climate. Weather is something that's constantly changing. You know, you might, it might be cool in the morning on your way to school. You might need to have a wear a sweatshirt. But by, the time the, but by the time school gets out in the afternoon, you don't need the sweatshirt anymore. You're in a T-shirt. So the best way to remember it is weather is what you're wearing and climate is what's in your closet. And climate is using averages, usually over at least 30 years, is how we determine climate. So looking at Earth's atmosphere, there's, it evolved in three major ways. It hasn't always been the, the atmosphere you and I are familiar with. So about 4.6 years ago, 4.6 billion years ago, when our Earth was first created, we had a lot of hydrogen and helium on this planet. And as you may or may not know, hydrogen and helium are very light elements. So those floated off into space. And then what we had quite we had a great deal of about four billion, three and a half billion years ago of the internal degassing of the planet. So we have a lot of a lot of volcanoes erupting, which resulted in CO2 being released as well as a lot of water. We learned earlier that CO2, a big uh, pool of CO2 is the Earth's ocean, so the Earth's oceans absorbed the CO2. But it's important to point out that there was no oxygen yet. It wasn't until about one billion years ago where we had these organisms, this blue-green algae in the ocean, started to convert that uh, carbon dioxide that was in the air and using it via photosynthesis, which gave us our free oxygen with, with what we have today. And today, if we look at a component of clean, dry air, the most the major element in our atmosphere is actually nitrogen. Our, ni our, L our atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, 21% being oxygen, and the 1% other gases and impurities. And quite a few things will vary as you go from place to place, location to location. And one of them, just in looking at this uh, chart or this map, is water vapor. You guys may have been someplace like in the southeast that's very humid climate. There's a lot of water vapor in that air compared to the southwest where it's less humid. So water vapor is one of the variable components. Another component which we you only see usually during a sunrise and a sunset are called aerosols. So an aerosol is a variable component and again you notice this when you see a sunrise or sunset. And all aerosols are, are tiny, tiny solid particles like dust or salt crystals if you're near the ocean and even water vapor in the air that scatter light. So the, that uh, Make sure you understand that aerosols are a component as well, a variable component. And the other component which we're going to look at later on in this lecture is ozone. Ozone varies depending on where you are in Earth's atmosphere, and in this case, the stratosphere. And again, we'll, go, we'll look at that later on. The other thing that's going to change in Earth's atmosphere is air pressure. And you may notice this when in an airplane or maybe driving up through higher altitudes, that air pressure is going to decrease as you increase in altitude. So again, you've noticed this as your air, ears pop, either landing or taking off in an airplane, or you'll notice it at higher elevations on a mountain. So this sums up our atmosphere. We have our different layers, which we're going to go into detail now. You may have graphed the temperatures and kind of noticed this freaky line that's changing. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Air pressure, as we just said, goes down as you increase, as does water vapor. So looking at the Earth's atmosphere, there's different layers, and these layers are based on temperature. And we're going to start from the bottom up. So the densest layer where most of Earth's nitrogen, oxygen, and water vapor occur is the troposphere. And this is where our weather occurs. This is where 
the highest point where airplanes will fly. So the troposphere is mostly where our interaction with the atmosphere takes place. And you have experienced the environmental lapse rate, again, locating to higher elevations. Higher elevations have less air pressure, and as a result, temperatures tend to decrease or will decrease as you increase in altitude. And the environmental lapse rate, you can look at about 3.5 degrees every 1,000 feet or 6.5 every kilometer you increase. You may have noticed in your graph, as you hit about 30 kilometers up, 40 kilometers up, instead of getting colder, it's the temperatures in our atmosphere start to warm up. And this is a main reason if we look in the stratosphere, and now we're looking at, I'm sorry, I said 30 kilometers, I meant 30,000 feet. When we talk about maybe 15 kilometers, 20 kilometers, our, increase, our temperature starts to increase. That is due to the maximum ozone. So the ozone that protects us from UV rays um, is in the stratosphere, and make sure you understand that. Beyond the stratosphere, we have our mesosphere, we have our thermosphere, we have our exosphere. And as we go up those layers, pressure and density continue to decrease. Something very important about the thermosphere, though, I want to point out, point out is that it does block out uh, harmful X-rays that are coming from solar radiation, as well as it also blocks a little bit of the UV rays, but again, mostly in the stratosphere. And in the thermosphere, it has these gas-charged molecules that are going to glow when um, solar radiation interacts with it. And that's how we get our aurora borealis in the northern hemisphere, or just another word for the northern lights. So those are your layers. Make sure you know them and make sure you understand that the main reason we change from layer to layer is the change in temperature. So we're going to look at insulation now. Insulation is just a long word for incoming solar radiation. We're going to see how all areas of the earth are getting a different amount of solar radiation day by day and location by location. One of the main reasons is due to the fact that the Earth is round. Some points, some layer points on the Earth that I want to point out, these imaginary lines, make sure we're going to be talking about right now coming up the equator. That's just separating the northern and the southern hemisphere. Tropic of Cancer is 23.5 degrees north. Tropic of Capricorn is 23.5 degrees south. And again, make sure you understand those as we move on, especially when uh, discussing the seasons. So we have this incoming solar radiation. There's certain things that are going to happen to the sun's rays as they hit the earth. Some of it's going to be reflected, and this is a very important word, albedo. We're going to talk about albedo later on, but albedo is how much is reflected. And looking at, you know, in this case, this fresh snow on the mountain has a high albedo. It's just a percentage on how much is reflected, whereas a black asphalt road is going to have a low albedo. It's being absorbed. Some of the sun is going to get a scattered, and as I just mentioned, also absorbed. And about 50% is absorbed at the Earth's surface. So the atmosphere is heated because of these greenhouse gases, and there in this middle we have water vapor and CO2. Water vapor and CO2, we've talked about it before, have this natural greenhouse effect where without it, life on Earth would not exist. The Earth would be a frozen ball of ice, and life would not exist as we know it. So the greenhouse gas is natural and it is necessary for life. Looking at albedo, because this is one of the um, reasons we have differential uh, temperatures on Earth. And as I mentioned, the higher the albedo, that means there's more reflection and less absorption. Places like the poles have 80 to 95% of the light being reflected. On the flip side of that, you go to the tropics or the equator where you have dense vegetation. You're looking at only 20, 10 to 20% of the uh, sun's rays being reflected, and that's going to play a big role in regards to weather and climate. The factors affecting insulation are also the angle at which the sun's rays hit the earth. So we use, we're going to use this flashlight analogy quite a bit here, but when you're near the tropics or in the in between the Tropic of Cancer and the Tropic of Capricorn, people living between these locations are getting direct sunlight, much more than in the mid-latitudes and the poles. So what has to happen is regions near the equator receive more solar energy than those mid- and latitude poles because energy is lost as it passes through the atmosphere. So if we use the uh, flashlight example, 
this light has to travel a larger distance, and when it hits the Earth, it spreads out more. And this would be our example of light hitting the poles in the mid-latitudes, whereas our 90-degree flashlight is not as spread out as much. That is an example of our tropics. So here's another example looking at just, again, how much light and the intensity. So the greater the angle, the greater the temperature difference, this should say. Because here, this has a less angle, and it's going to be, you see less temperature variations in the tropics. And then you'll see this quite a bit through this lecture. You can just tell, again, as we go north or south of the equator, the rays become more oblique, or you can say more concentrated at the equator and more diffused at the poles. And this is as we've been talking about already. And we can see just at in regards to the duration of sunlight. We all have the same date here, and if you notice, we'll start from the bottom up. We're going from the equator north, and you can see not only is the angle of the sun getting lower in the sky as we travel closer to the North Pole, here we're at the equator, here we're at 60 degrees north, but even the duration of time. So that's going to play a huge role in regards to weather and climate. And there's a lot going on here, but here we have our insulation, we have the months on the bottom, and you can see it varies not as much when you're at the equator compared to when you're at the poles. And again, we'll hit more on this in class. Time of day as well, usually it's warmer in the afternoon. That makes perfect sense because the sun is at a higher angle in the sky. Finally, we're going to close out this chapter looking at the seasons. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this chapter, the seasons are a direct result of this changing angle of the sun. And a lot of it has to do with two main reasons. The sun's angle is going to change throughout the year, and the amount of daylight is going to change. But there's a couple motions I want to hit on before we move on. First is rotation. Rotation is very simple. The earth is spinning on its axis. It takes just over 24 hours a day. So rotation determines night and day. That's all it determines. Please don't get confused. It's revolution now. Revolution is determining one year. It takes 365 and a quarter days for the earth to revolve around the sun once. And I want to point out really quick on this animation is notice that the axis of the earth is always pointing, in this case, to the top left. And that's going to play a huge role when we talk about seasons here. So before we move on, this would be a perfect, uh, this is a great uh, visual noticing our longest day of the year is on the first day of summer. Shortest is in December. And again, these are all in the northern hemisphere. And I want you to notice this sun angle. This would be a person standing very close to about 40 degrees north of the equator. Notice on the longest day of the year, the sun is not 90 degrees overhead. It's 73 and a half. And look at how much lower it is in the sky in December. And we'll talk about that now, which will hopefully make more sense. So the reason we have our seasons is our axis is tilted 23 and a half degrees and we're always pointed in the same direction as we saw in that animation. So because of that, we're going to have some special days and I'm only going to refer to the northern hemisphere here. Moving on, just know if you are in the southern hemisphere, it would be the opposite. So again, here's our axis. We are tilted 23 and a half degrees and notice in December it is pointing in this direction, you can go six months later, it is pointing this direction. So that's playing a huge role in determining how much sunlight our any location on Earth is getting. We'll start with the summer solstice. This usually is lands between June 21st and 22nd. And the sun is hitting the Earth directly at 23 and a half degrees north, which means that is the only area on Earth that is getting um, 90 degree hit by 90 degrees of sunlight. And notice it is the northern hemisphere facing the sun. So the northern hemisphere is leaning towards the sun. That is getting more of the sun's direct sun rays, which makes sense. In the northern hemisphere, it is summer. And we've seen certain things with the solstice, places like Stonehenge. A lot of people uh, relied on the location of the sun in regards to when to plant crops, when to have festivals, and so on. So these are very, very important dates. Fast forward six months later, we're on the December or I'm sorry, the winter solstice, which is occurring December 21st and 22nd. 
Now our sun, the sun's rays is hitting the Tropic of Capricorn, 23 and a half degrees south. And if you look, now the northern hemisphere is facing away from the sun. So now people in the northern hemisphere are not getting the sun's direct rays, which means less sun in the sky, duration, less duration of the sun in the sky, and the insulation is not as direct, resulting in winter. In between our solstices, we have our equinoxes, so our autumnal or fall equinox, and these are will help equinox think equator. So on the first day of fall on September 22nd, 23rd, the sun is directly hitting the equator, same as the spring equinox. This should be corrected in your notes. We'll actually correct it right now. I'm sorry, I did correct it. It is March, my bad. So in March, something also for equinox. It is all equinox think equator, but when you see equinox think equal light, it doesn't matter if you're at the North Pole that day, if you're at the equator, or somewhere in between. Equinox also means equal light. Both, you're gonna have both 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness on any equinox, spring or autumn. So here's how it looks in the whole scheme of things. Always remember that that um, Earth's axis is always tilted in the same direction, resulting in chain, the, the sun's changing angle, uh, more or less insulation as the year goes on, and in turn these are going to affect the weather, the climate, and which we're going to see later on, the sun or the wind and the um, water, ocean currents throughout the year affecting weather and climate as well. So that wraps up our lecture on insulation, unequal heating of the earth. As always, if you have any questions, hit, the, hit up the website or you can always shoot me an email. See ya.